great, John. We are ready, so go ahead. Hi. Good day. Sorry that I couldn't be there. I was looking forward to it, but it didn't work out, unfortunately. I'm here today to talk about machine health monitoring using acoustic sensing at the edge. I'm from uh, Sound Sensing. I'm the head of uh, data science and machine learning. We are a small company based in uh, Oslo. Uh, we are early phase. We have been running for two years now. And we have backed by a strong team of engineers, and, uh, sales developers, and of course, a large team of investors. So what we focus on is condition monitoring, which is uh, making sure that machines, uh, mechanical machines especially, operate correctly. And we focus on commercial buildings. Uh, this is technology that is often used in industry, everything from oil and gas to uh, manufacturing, process industry, and so on. Uh, but we are targeting uh, commercial buildings. Um, you are in a building, a conference uh, building right now. It has a lot of uh, facilities that hopefully you as a tenant and, um, uh, don't uh, notice. Things work as they should, and you don't notice any problems. Uh, but this is actually a continuous job for uh, the building manager to and the janitors and the technical uh, staff to make sure that it is the case. If you have a large building, things do go wrong all the time over, over the year and over the many years. So there's fresh air that needs to work. There is heating and cooling. There is uh, lighting. There's drinking water, hot water, and, and many other uh, things. And we focus on the equipment that's uh, centered in what's called mechanical uh, rooms. So in a modern building, a lot of the equipment that make these services uh, work is placed in what's called a mechanical room, a technical room, uh, where you have the large parts of the ventilation system, of the pump system, cooling systems, and so on. So here in this image, we see actually on the left side, this big uh, box of uh, uh, many uh, things that you can uh, open is actually the air handling unit of the ventilation system, which is a core part. If that stops to work, uh, you can have a severe reduction in energy efficiency. You will have poor uh, air, either too cold, too warm, not enough uh, oxygen, too much uh, debris. Um, and in the bit kind of middle to the right is actually part of the uh, ventilation system, which is using uh, pumps. Uh, so that also needs to work. And far in the back, there's pumps for, uh, for other systems. Um, so we uh, place uh, sensors into these um, uh, rooms and we use sound because it uh, enables us to monitor an area of uh, machines uh, um, in combination with vibration sensors, which are point-based from it to the other machine. So um, machines fail in many ways. Uh, you can have failures that are at least with a given sensor modality, unobservable. So those are, of course, uh, by nature, uh, it's not something that you uh, try to do uh, some detection with. You can have, I'm going from the bottom, you can have failure events, which um, where you have a, there's, there's a sound or there's a change in the temperature and so on that only occurs at a specific moment, and then the problem is uh, uh, unobservable after that. This could be if there would be a, um, uh, like a spark, for example, where the spark isn't an, uh, normally a problem, but maybe it didn't cause uh, the thing to fail immediately. You could only hear a little spark. And that's, uh, those are tricky to detect because they are rare, very rare. And you can have gradual shifts. Um, this is, you always have this in some way or another in the mechanical system. Um, where you have, for example, bearings that wear out over time. You have belts that wear out over time. Um, the impellers in pumps, uh, these have a tendency to gradually um, decrease. And um, the models that you use there are, are relatively simple. It's about getting the right um, quality of, uh, of data, often over many years and for many uh, equipment types. It's about trend fitting and predictive models. Um, we focus mostly on the top here, which we we'll, uh, call um, a state change, where you have a relatively abrupt um, uh, failure. And this could actually happen at the end of a 
<clears throat> gradual shift, for example, if you have a bearing that's for, over many years has been operating uh, okay, towards the end it might, uh, lubrication might have gone out. Um, and uh, at the end it starts to deteriorate faster. And at some point it will deteriorate quite quickly. And this is a threshold a state change that we can detect. And then uh, one can also detect that uh, at some point it might actually break down, it might uh, seize, like lock. Uh, and we have actually detected a few of these uh, problems in production ventilation systems. And the techniques that are used there are what's called anomaly detection and change point detection. So this is what we will uh, focus on today. So in order to understand anomaly detection, uh, let's contrast it with classification. So with classification, you typically you use supervised learning where you have label data, um, you have examples in the binary classification, you have examples of, uh, you could have normal data uh, or you could have abnormal or failure data. Uh, if you do this with classification, your classifier will create a decision boundary between these known classes and these known samples. So this is shown to the left here um, where uh, this example, the training is these blue dots in the center and the uh, red dots on the left side. However, if we would get new uh, sample points in this um, feature space, um, if we would get two, uh, new sample points of failures on the right side of this uh, normal cluster in the center, uh, the classifier would classify this as normal because it doesn't it falls on the normal side of this decision boundary so and this is a big problem uh, when it comes to typical failures uh, out in the in the wild that uh, binary classification uh, will tend to fail on novel anomalies um, so this approach is not suited uh, for that uh, reason and the other um, problem with classification is that it requires a large amount of labeled training data. And this um, failures are, although they are a problem and for an operator happens uh, all the time across their buildings, they are quite rare. So failure might happen in a given machine once per year. Um, and uh, each failure is typically different. So are, there's a large amount of variety. And to approach that with classification, it takes uh, years and years and years of just data collection, and hopefully you then would represent all the uh, possible types of failures. But in that time, the, um, the world has progressed and machines have become different, processes are not operated differently. And so it's, um, it's, a, um, it's a game that you cannot uh, really win. So instead, what one does is, uh, for the majority of cases, is to apply some sort of uh, anomaly or outlier detection, where we model uh, the normal data only. So this is sometimes called one class um, classification because we, we assume that the, the training data is uh, predominantly normal, potentially with some uh, contamination that is called if it's uh, non-normal samples in the training set. Um, and then we, mo we model only the normal class. So it will create, a, uh, um, yeah, it will only uh, treat things that are close to the normal as normal and everything else as uh, abnormal, including things that have never been uh, seen before. Um, and this needs um, only normal data, at least in the training sample. Of course, for hyperparameter optimization and for validation and evaluation of performance, you do want to have some label samples, but you can get pretty far with maybe just uh, 10 examples uh, we'll, uh, uh, to just tell you the rough, uh, um, uh, the expected performance of, uh, of this because it's not needed for the optimization of the model itself, which is much more data hungry. And typically in classification requires uh, 1000 samples per uh, class and hundreds of samples per each uh, individual uh, type, subtype inside the class. Um, so this handles a uh, novel um, uh, problems uh, well, which is very important. Um, so that's uh, normal detection, and that's what we will focus on. Try to introduce it because it's not as common as uh, classification when it comes to edge processing or other processing. 
Now, an, another challenge, um, apart from the limited uh, data that one has in these uh, scenarios, is that the sensor modality which we use uh, is often sound or sometimes uh, vibration. Um, that has a very high data rate, uh, 48 kilohertz, for example, audio sample, or maybe even 96 uh, kilohertz for some vibration uh, measurements and ultrasound. Um, but the, the parameter that we're interested in is, for example, the pump operating state. Like, is, is this pump in a, in a good um, operating uh, state or is it not? Maybe it has, uh, there's uh, uh, air coming into the system. We would want to do, be able to detect that. And we don't care about it at the microsecond level, which is what uh, audio sample rates are. Neither the millisecond or even the second, um, these uh, scenarios that we are operating in, uh, if we can uh, alert people within uh, 10 minutes or even 30 uh, minutes after something uh, is starting to happen or has happened, that is uh, very great. So that's the, you know, the output of our system is much lower. So that's a down sampling factor of 172 million times. Um, so we need to do that um, uh, in a smart way that uh, provides the information um, and processes the data efficiently. And then uh, there's even longer term, uh, when we're talking about this gradual change, we even want more long-term um, uh, time series. So for example, bearing uh, wear is uh, often uh, uh, measured uh, once per month. So because it's something that happens over five, seven, maybe 10 years, uh, more data is not, uh, more fine grained resolution is not really uh, needed to make those trends. Uh, so sensor data is very high frequency, and we are doing this with IoT systems. So basically, our edge uh, challenge is where where is the boundary between our edge system and our cloud system, especially when it comes to the data rate. What is the data rate that we are transmitting between these? Because this influences uh, the cost of trans uh, transferring data. It influences uh, what uh, radio technologies are available for transmission technology and uh, it influences the battery lifetime because it tends to be that uh, sending data is one of the most energy costly things that the sensor does. Um, also important to understand in this anomaly detection uh, world is that um, the models are not static because the world is not static. So um, your office over a uh, day has different uh, uh, patterns, operating patterns. For example, ventilation systems are typically off during the night because uh, it doesn't need to run. Um, it might have what's called demand uh, control ventilation. So it means that during the day, as people come and go and use the meeting rooms and so on, the ventilation system runs uh, at different speeds uh, in order to uh, maintain quality, but at the lowest possible energy efficiency. So it means that's a dynamic system um, that's just during the day. And then during the week, uh, often people work uh, maybe Monday to Friday or uh, and Saturday and Sunday. Uh, there's not so many people or you have uh, alternate uses of the same building at that time. Um, uh, so in this case, it causes weekly variations. And of course, the uh, weather and the seasons, summer versus winter, causes a big uh, change in a building's operation. For example, um, in, in Norway, most of the time you need to heat your space because it's a relatively cold place. Um, uh, but in the winter, in the summer months, there are some times where you uh, mostly need to uh, cool your space. And this is actually, um, the systems are often uh, separate. So uh, different systems are in use in the winter versus the summer. So that means that our models need to update continuously. And um, so this is illustrated here where we have our data stream. This could be data, for example, per day. Uh, in, in mocks, and uh, we need to run training. We need to have some historical data to understand the normal, uh, what is normal. And then um, uh, we input this to the training process. And then when today's data, for example, comes in, we'll use uh, the model uh, for the, it's using the preceding week or, or month. And we'll use that to, to determine uh, how, uh, if things are going okay or, or not. But then tomorrow, uh, we'll basically uh, uh, repeat the process. We'll look back the same amount of time, and we'll create a new model. 
the models are continuously shifting. Of course, they are, um, unless there have been abrupt changes in the, in the pattern, um, they are not very different the models, but they are, uh, they are different uh, instances. And, uh, um, they compensate then for the change, especially over the system. So, uh, so there's a range of models and each model is also device specific because what is normal for one device, for example, mounted in one ventilation system uh, is not the same as the normal for another device mounted in a, uh, another ventilation system, which could be, which is in a different building and different operating uh, parameters and so on. So th there are many, many models. We're not talking about a single model. We're talking about uh, one model per time period per uh, device. This is uh, uh, thousands, tens of thousands of individual models for a, for a small fleet of a consultant. So how does the edge fit into this? So uh, I'll talk about three, uh, like edge AI is a, it's a big topic in, in many ways. Uh, talk about three kind of aspects uh, of it. Uh, edge pre-processing, Using the processing on the edge, edge inference where we run some uh, trained uh, train model, uh, typically trained in the cloud, and then we're running um, uh, inference on the edge, and then edge uh, learning. This is very different. Where what people? It's important to be specific when we're talking about edge AI. Like what pieces of AI uh, do we use? Which are on the edge and which are in the cloud, and how do they interact? So we have uh, our own developed uh, sound uh, sensors. Uh, the DB20 has a built-in 4G cellular mode. In. So it has internal battery for one week and uh, can use uh, 12 or 24 weeks for long-term use. This is not a battery-powered device, uh, at least in production um, setting. Um, but um, um, it's typically then powered inside the, or by the same things that power the machines. And it supports edge uh, pre-processing and edge um, inference. So when we do this acoustic anomaly detection, we have a basic uh, flow of data. Uh, so we have the sensor installed in a location of interest. Here there's some ventilation uh, uh, shaft behind, and there's some valves here of a cooling uh, system in the front. And we have some sound that uh, comes in. This is a, a waveform. It can be converted to a spectrogram, which we see here. We, typically, we can separate um, the processing of this as uh, some sort of feature extraction, where we're going from the quite complex data into smaller um, set of data that is, uh, it, it might be human understandable or it might not be, depends on strategy. Um, this could be a learned uh, step, or it could be a manual um, uh, engineered uh, step. Um, and then we do some sort of anomaly score, which is basically how how uh, abnormal um, is that we're currently getting with respect to the typical pattern. And the typical pattern uh, in this context is then for the preceding week or uh, preceding uh, month, something in that time period. And then we do some sort of um, uh, thresholding in order to convert it to a discrete uh, event such that we can raise an alarm when something has um, has happened. So here's um, illustrations. This is from the open DKS21 uh, dataset. Um, where in the top you have a pump running normally. Not sure how well you see this, but it's a relatively constant uh, pattern um, in the middle uh, or two thirds up. Um, on the y-axis, there's a, there's a kind of a straight band going along it. Also at the bottom is... Um, in the malfunction case, this, uh, what was a straight band, uh, has kind of split. So something has shifted a little bit up in frequency, so on the y-axis. Some uh, parts are now more energetic, a little bit lower frequency. And there's some sort of undulating pattern here. Going up and down, up and down, up and down. Because these are different. Um, this is something you would want to do. I'll show uh, one example, another case. I hope sound works. Share sound. 
Not a piece of it. Bread. Ah, ads. Fantastic. I tried to preload it. I have no idea why there's ads. It's even on my own uh, private YouTube channel. This is ridiculous. Okay, I am very sorry. I hope someone at Google is too. Se for at det nye 5G-nettet eller nord vil ha så mye kraft og fart. Yeah, I see. Okay, here now the normal operation. The bearing uh, sound. Now we are introducing a fault. We can hear that the sound is relatively similar, but it drops in frequency. It has to work much harder to pump now because the uh, inlet is blocked. And we can do the same with the outlet. And then this operate uh, this primarily this is uh, in this case the anomaly is a shift in frequency, a little bit of a shift in the uh, and the time patterns as well, but small. And then it's detected by the sensor and the um, flag anomaly. This is we use these um, test jigs as controlled uh, tests, so that because failures happen very rarely, it's very useful to be able to introduce them in a representative manner in the construction. So we build these test jigs um, that represent different systems. And we use them uh, for um, data collection, and we also test. So, how to, to realize such a system and how, <clears throat> how does the edge you in here? So we have the raw audio coming in, the sensor, and uh, it's, it's a very large data rate. So if you stream this, it's around uh, 240 gigabytes per month, which is uh, 4G, very cost prohibitive, uh, completely uh, useless uh, use of uh, video. Um, um, so what we do in the edge preprocessing case, we uh, convert this down into a spectrogram, which is a time frequency representation, showed you uh, before, of the sound. It becomes an image. You can also interpret it as a human uh, with some training. Um, and if you use 150 second resolution, some research has shown that it's not possible to uh, recover speech anymore. So it's a privacy compatible. Uh, representation. And if you have it uncompressed, it's down 14 kilobytes per minute. And uh, we use some compression on this to get down to um, B, which is then 120 megabytes per month, which is a very manageable uh, amount of data to send on uh, 4G um, or Wi Fi or um, uh, wireless transports. And it's also uh, most, it's uh, 1,000 times production in bandwidth. It serves the majority of the acoustical information needed to detect problems. This is already a, a, a win. How can we go further? And so uh, you can use it's called an autoencoder in order to actually do the um, normally detection. The principle is that you uh, in the training uh, case, here there's given numbers in to learn to uh, compress that order and decoder pair and reconstruct it uh, well. Give an input that was not in training, uh, it will uh, reconstruct this very poorly. Use this uh, error then. To, uh, and there are many variations um, proposed uh, on this topic. It's very widely researched, for example, in the case uh, uh, conference. And Here's just a couple examples where instead of trying to reconstruct the entire spectrogram, as shown at the left side, the classic one, you can try to, for example, predict a future time frame, or you can try to predict uh, the middle, trying to fill in a spectrogram. And this, they tend to do it. 
So now we, what we can do is we can put this neural network onto uh, the edge device uh, using something like uh, Edge Impulse or using Byte, uh, many uh, tools or XCube AI from SD. Um, and this means that the model is being trained in the cloud, and as I mentioned, per device and per time. And then we deploy it to our device with the firmware over the edge. And then um, we can output the anomaly score directly from the device. What this enables us is we don't need to send all the spectrograms anymore, but it's important to realize that we still want to send some spectrum because we need the training data in the cloud. So uh, what we might do is go down to, say, 10% of um, spectrograms, uh, one per then that's around megabytes. But we need to use updates. Yeah, that will uh, estimate here to be. So it's not a, you know, you never win 100%. What we could do instead is to um, uh, use a neural network which is not specific to the particular device and time, shown here in the in the cell. So do what's called representation learning, where um, we might use data from all the devices in order to learn the compressed representation and uh, outputs a, for example, a sixteen-dimensional uh, vector that's compressing all the information down, and. Uh,